In the case of Fizetin, um, we are seeing uh, benefit. Um, we're about to release a, a publication with Yale where... Hi, Ryan. Yeah, so it's great to uh, have you back on the podcast again. It feels like quite a while. So, yeah, we've got quite a few topics to dive into. You were saying you've seen quite a few exciting bits of research recently with some of these popular anti-aging supplements, spermidine, quercetin. I don't know if there's any particular um, fisetin. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything exciting that's come out recently? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I haven't seen a lot on, on necessarily spermidine um, or quercetin. You know, I think that, um, y you know, we, we are certainly seeing, uh, you know, autophagy being a process which when upregulated tends to be better. The question is, does supplemental spermidine actually do that? Um, mm. and, and I still don't know the answer to that, um, mm. you know, uh, unfortunately. But I think that in the case of fisetin, um, we are seeing uh, benefit. Um, we're about mm -hmm. to release a, a publication with Yale where we look at every published and a lot of our private data sets on, you know, um, interventional treatments. So we sort of combine it all into one um, sort of model and look at what was sort of the best for biological clocks across the board versus, um, you know, uh, uh, which were some of the worst. And and uh, along with that, I think that we see fisetin, especially when added to disatinib and quercetin, generally tend to be a benefit um, versus, um, you know, a negative. And in some of our new analysis, we actually saw that that decided of course it did, did start to improve some of those second and third generation clocks which is not what we found in our initial study uh we oh, okay, found no right. change in our initial study but now that's changing i think uh with some advanced statistical methods and some additional data so we're starting to see that it is actually having improvement um, um which is i think helpful but we're also seeing that improvement be a larger magnitude when fisetin is added versus just the disatinib and quercetin regularly um so mm -hmm. I, I tend to say that uh my uh my conception of what's happening with Synalytics has actually uh, probably changed over the course of the past six months. I, I used mm. to think maybe it's not the biggest benefit, um, but now yeah, I can understand. Yeah, with the disatinib, disatin, mm. what's it called again? Disatinib and yeah, quercetin. Yeah. I remember saying even it has some negative on a Gen One clock. It actually went the wrong way, didn't it? Is that right? It did, yeah. The, yeah those yeah. first generation clocks, trained on chronological age, uh, they all went up uh, with treatment, which again we know is not the right, uh, um, mm. the the right direction. Um, and and so I think that now we're certainly still seeing that increase uh, on the first generation clocks, but we're seeing now decreases in these second and third generation clocks, mm, um, okay. which is more like what we saw with that caloric restriction study, which is first generation clocks go up, but the second and third go down. And um, so I think that tells us a lot of things, which is don't use a first generation clock. I think you and I have talked about that before. It just doesn't give you the right data um, on, on movement. But I think the other thing is that we're now with more data starting to see significant improvements with uh, disatinib and quercetin, but definitely with the addition of fisetin as well. Okay. And then I think and we've, we've talked about, sorry, I was going to say, we talked about fisetin before <laughs> and then it's like a funny one trying to get the right, I've seen people do it continuously all year round or a very long cycle. So I'm like, oh, same with quercetin too. And I'm like, you probably mm -hmm. don't want to be doing that. And um, I'm just coming to the end of a Fisertin cycle myself. I just do 30 days, something like that. And then mm -hmm. I think that, uh, what do you think, 30 days, something is probably sufficient? Oh, yeah, I still don't know. I, I you know, yeah. I think that the, the question here is pulse it in big doses. Um, mm -hmm. So your body has time to clear the, the senescent cells, which are, are, are you know, uh, are, are being taken care of. The other is to do it more consistently. So you're consistently getting that that dose. And, and the answer is, I still don't know what's the better protocol. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know that I've seen actually many studies on this one way or another. Um, you know, I think... Uh, um, you know, the majority, I think, of what I'm seeing now in senescence are cellular therapies, how to program your natural killer cells to actually target senescence and get them out of your system. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a really exciting uh, therapy, uh, you know, with probably less disadvantages than some of the small molecule synolytics. Um, but, uh, but, but again, I'm not sure if you should pulse it or you should take it more consistently. I see people doing both, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure that we have data on what works better. Yeah, I mean, I guess because you get, we're talking about you know, spermidine and chrysotin before mm -hmm. you, I mean, you obviously get trace amounts in your diet, especially if you were to eat, what, loads of mushrooms in the case of spermidine, I guess you'd get trace amounts all year round. But yeah, as you say, pulsing a huge amount of any of these things probably all, all year round or for a long period yeah. may start to go the other way and have a negative consequence. Yeah, and I, and I, I can certainly see the 
both the rationale for both. You know, I, I, to mm. me, I think that we did a pulse strategy in that decidimacorsetin data where we were just doing 1,000 milligrams, I think, of physetin once per week. Um, and then we did the decidimacorsetin on days one, two, and three um, for, for every month for six months. And so, um, you know, altogether, it wasn't a, a huge therapy duration. Um, mm. uh, and I think that it was just sort of the idea is to try and clear those cells, get your body to clean it up, uh, and then, mm. you know, try and do it again at regular intervals to keep that overall burden low um, and I, I maybe it depends on when you start as well maybe uh, you know for people who have you know maybe uh, younger it might be a more consistent dosing strategy that works better because you're not causing a lot of burden right, uh, just yeah, yeah. you know sort of senescent clearance whereas for older individuals maybe a pulse strategy is better because they've got higher burden of senescent cells in the first place hmm. yeah oh, that makes sense so what do you think about uh, green coffee and then having that um, as a kind of senolytic doing that like say if you're fasting and then especially that's my idea is you not into a deep fast, so like 14 or say so up to 16 hour fast, you do some exercise with a green coffee capsule. So you're kind of activating yeah. uh, autophagy that way. What do, you, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I, I certainly think that there, there there are multiple things that that help. I think increase autophagy during those periods. Um, that's probably certainly one of them. You know, I think the ECGC uh, that you know that's in tea or coffee mm -hmm. or you know the, these sort of uh, polyphenols they're really interesting from a DNA methylation perspective because they um, all, you know the, these polyphenols actually inhibit the DNA methyltransferases, which regulate you know the methylation patterns across your your DNA, and so. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we know that they're having an epigenetic mechanism um, for for some of this in, in terms of its regulatory effect. Uh, I, I think that it's such a broad regulatory effect because you're really you know dealing with one of the things that regulates your your you know genetic profiling that it's hard to say if it's good or bad. But I think that we certainly do know that it helps increase autophagy, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know those things like ketones, you know uh, things which you know help you know even some of those uh, short chain triglycerides um, or the medium chain triglycerides, right? All of those things tend to, I think, help improve some of your, uh, your, your uh, synthesis of, 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 of fat and tissue into energy. And, um, mm. and I think that probably all of them might have a, a beneficial effect in, in any time that you're trying to increase autophagy. Yeah, yeah, no, because you, you mentioned about uh, EGCG. And then so, <laughs> yeah, you could do, often I might have a green tea like, mm. at the same time with the green coffee capsule. And then, because I understand, because um, it increases the expression of uh, the FOXO3 gene, mm -hmm. green yeah, tea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, and then it activates autophagy itself, doesn't it? So, um, yeah. And then I wondered, like, if you to do a sauna at the same time, like after mm -hmm. exercise, and you maybe like, because I know I understand that activates the FOXO3 gene. So you're trying to get hit it from multiple different pathways. Yeah, different areas. Or, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, up, um, angles. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and again, you know, this is so, you know, a lot of, I think, uh, as we're talking about the DNA methyl estrogen transferases and, you know, things like the histone deacetylases, mm -hmm. right, these are pretty well controlled mechanisms within our body. If something mm -hmm. went wrong with them, generally, um, that's deadly, right? Um, uh, and, and so I think that, you know, that there's going to be a level of biohacking, which maybe I think maxes out some of that epigenetic regulation, but some of those downstream effects, like, for instance, with, the, you know, the sauna where you're, you know, improving heat shock proteins for better folding, you know, all of those things, uh, I, I think certainly make sense. And I, I think if, you know, there, uh, my, my big conception of aging right now is, is, is always changing, right? You know, it's always hard to define aging, but I mm -hmm. think that, you know, with the research and literature that I'm seeing out there now, I, I certainly think that, um, most researchers are, are, are thinking about aging in, in, in two main ways. One is this random aging um, entropy, I think, this what they call the stochasticity, which is that, you know, as we get older, our the information in our epigenetics slowly starts to deteriorate, right? Um, mm -hmm. So our cells become less effective at doing what they're supposed to. And I think that's sort of this progressive loss of function over time that we consider aging. You know, uh, for instance, Dr. David Sinclair talks about his epigenetic theory of information where we lose information over time. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and then slowly that causes this deterioration. Um, you know, I think that uh, along with that, one of the big drivers of that is um, you know, all of these things which um, increase protein 
folding problems, uh, right? They create these protein aggregates, almost like prions within our cell, which then harm the mitochondria, which then, you know, sort of create this, this additional process. And that can be a dynamic process or a stochastic process of just entropy. And I think that anything where we're, you know, um, encouraging autophagy uh, to help improve protein synthesis or doing sauna to improve heat shock proteins and help with the protein folding. I think all of those things are great preventative strategies because they, they just encourage our body to do a sort of the cleanup that, that we need to be doing 24 seven mm. to reduce this deterioration. And so I think yeah. that um, in, in my opinion, what we'll see over the course of the next, you know, uh, decade or so is that we'll see that all these things which improve our body's ability to self regulate um, uh, are going to be the things that have the, the biggest increase on health span, um, and, and make us more less likely to, to deteriorate slowly. Um, and if we can continue to improve those, I think that we'll certainly increase health span and hopefully over time increase lifespan as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. 